Hi everyone, I'm Erin Morgan, the Executive Director of the Ontario Cooperative Association, and I am excited to tell you all about my favourite business model, the Cooperative Business Model. Thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation about cooperatives. There are a number of worksheets and other resources available to anyone interested in learning more about cooperatives after watching this presentation, and I will include the documents and links with this presentation for your teacher. Let's get started. Music Pop Quiz In the music business, what do you think the figure 66 cents represents? Bands signed to record companies generally receive about 66 cents for every $13 album sold. The rest goes to the record company. The music industry and a lot of other businesses feel like this, where the artist in their 66 cents is the little fish. Everyone intrinsically understands that this as the primary form of most business. Grow as big as you can, as fast as you can. Grow shareholder value year over year. Earn profits and beat the competition. I'm sure you know the buzzwords and the philosophies of many entrepreneurs. It's strictly business. Mind your own business. It's a dog eat dog world. Business is business. You know the rest. But does it have to be this way? Nope. So what I want you to do is put this music business example in the back of your brain and we're going to come back to it later to see if we can figure out a way of writing that wrong. And to do that, today I want to show you an alternative way of doing business that's getting a ton of attention. I'm going to let you in on one of the best kept secrets in business. But before we get into that, we're going to do a little work. Grab the handout that says create a co-op at the top. In the next minute or so, you can jot down some answers to the questions in the top box only. Okay, let's take a minute to brainstorm this all-important question. What is a need in your life, your community, or your city? Is there a theater in your town? A great live music spot for students? Who's into skateboarding, mountain biking, weightlifting? Can you do these sports in your hometown? Or do you have to drive a distance to play or purchase equipment? What would be the ultimate business you'd love to start? Remember, your answer should be realistic, so no saying owning a pro sports team or building a casino in Las Vegas. Think about something you're passionate about and would really see starting like a graphic design company, becoming a freelance photographer or event planning, or starting a wellness center. Please pause the presentation and complete the top part of the Create Your Own Co-op handout now. Okay, we'll come back to these ideas in a minute. Now I'm going to show you some logos and I want you to shout out the company names before I do. Apple Pepsi Adidas World Wildlife Fund United Nations Fair Trade Habitat for Humanity And before the next slide, I'll be amazed if anyone can name the next one. Did anybody get this one? Really? No one? You're breaking my heart! This is the world's logo for credit unions. And this is one of the main reasons I'm sharing this presentation today, as there are actually 51,000 credit unions in the world. And in many other countries and continents around the world, such as Italy, Spain, and across Africa and South America, this logo is instantly recognizable. And to many of them, this logo is a symbol of an institution that has saved their community or village. However, despite this, as you can see, we're still playing catch up here in, in terms of knowing what this movement is all about. So don't worry if you know what a credit union is. We'll go through it today. But to give you a little teaser, credit unions are part of a larger group of businesses called the cooperative sector. Hopefully you recognize some of these companies. The Cooperators Insurance, Gailey Foods, Mountain Equipment Co-op or MEC as they're more commonly known. 
the Green Bay Packers, and Sunkiss, to name a few. You can think of this group of businesses, this cooperative sector, as if they're all part of one family tree. Now you're probably wondering just how an insurance company, a dairy company, a hotel chain, and a sporting goods store, an orange juice company, a pro soccer team, and an NFL team could possibly all belong to the same family tree. Well, like in most families, members of the family may do different things, have very different skills, and work in very different areas, but yet, despite this, they're still connected. By genetics, of course, meaning how they're built, and also by a way of being, a moral code. This is just like the cooperative sector. This may be what I think is coolest about the cooperative model. As it is, in fact, the only business model in the world to follow a set of universal principles. And these principles are based on democracy, inclusivity, sustainability, and community. We'll get into these principles in a little bit, but before we go any further, let me ask. Do you know a little bit about the cooperative business structure and makes, what makes it so unique? This has nothing to do with the co-op work placements. So here's the problem. Not many people know much or anything about co-ops, but because of how sustainable they are and how beneficial they are for the community. In 2012, the United Nations actually declared the cooperative structure to be the business model of the future. So we're going to get into this today and I'm going to show you some examples of super cool cooperative businesses that people in their 20s and even your age are starting and why they're so successful. Okay, so let's go back to the start. Why do you start a business? To make money, right? Now, is that a bad thing? No, of course not. And cooperatives can be very profitable. However, the key difference with cooperatives is that while profit can definitely be a reason to start a business, co-ops believe that profit can't and shouldn't be the only reason to start a business. What happens when you only care about profit? You often end up with profit before the planet. Here's a picture of a river in the Philippines. And here's an example of the forest devastated by clear cutting. And thanks to an oil spill, there's a river somewhere under the sea of dead fish. When a company is only concerned with making as much money as possible, you often end up with profit before people. This smog isn't natural. It's a result of the terrible air pollution from so many cars, coal plants, and Beijing's relaxed attitude toward environmental laws. And an example of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, beautifully and tragically shown in this picture from India, where a little wall divides the resort and the slum. The philosophy of profit, above all else, has resulted in an obscene amount of greed such as the immoral actions by those working in some of the world's largest financial, financial institutions that led to the financial collapse of 2008. This greed and corruption has in turn resulted in scenes such as these. We often pride ourselves on being the most evolved humans in history, in having created the most civilized societies. But take a look. Are we really? These pictures were all taken in the last few years in Toronto, Greece, Manchester, and Egypt. We need to ask ourselves, is this really the best we could do? Is this the world we'd want to live in? Are the systems we've put in place, the capitalist, for-profit, at all cost culture, the best we can come up with? Once again, we need to ask the question, does it have to be this way? We in the cooperative sector don't buy that things have to be this way. We believe that in business you can be profitable and also have a social conscience and do good for the community. The cooperative business model is an alternative to this capitalist system. So we keep using the term cooperative business. It's probably time we actually get into what they are and how they work. A cooperative business is different in that when you're thinking of starting a co-op, the first question isn't how can I make as much profit as possible, as fast as possible, 
but rather, where is there a need to be filled? And because cooperatives are concerned with filling a need and being as democratic as possible, they go way beyond the profit-only mentality. Co-ops are concerned with the four Ps. Yes, profit, but also people, planet, and principles. So as co-ops, we would never think of using or working with a company that uses sweatshops or that would harm the environment. And this is because of the all-important fourth P, our principles. This is where the co-op model stands apart from other businesses. As we said before, the co-op model is the only business model in the world to follow a set of principles. And here they are. Now, don't worry, you don't have to memorize them all. But one that I do want to highlight is this one member, one vote principle, as I think this is the most important one that makes co-ops so unique. What this principle means is that no matter how much money you have or invest into a co-op, you can never have more than one vote. That is so powerful because it means everybody is equal. Even if you're a multi-millionaire, you can never buy more power or more votes. So it's totally democratic. And what's truly amazing is that if you walk into a dairy co-op in India or a credit union in Alaska, a coffee co-op in Peru or a factory co-op in Italy, all of them will be following these principles. And while we in Canada may not be so familiar with co-ops just yet, they really are a global force, as you can see by the numbers here. Over 51,000 credit unions, 750,000 cooperatives, and 1 billion members worldwide. And once again, they're all connected by the same code and structure. So how does a co-op work? What is this unique structure we keep talking about? Basically, the co-op structure has been designed so that a business is truly about being for the people, by the people. Okay, so there are a couple of different kinds of co-ops. One is the worker co-op. The way a worker co-op works is that those who work at the business, the staff, actually own the company together, equally. To officially incorporate as a worker cooperative, you need to have at least three people involved. You can have thousands or millions of worker members, but the minimum is three. Why do you think that you need at least three? What happens in a partnership when there's a disagreement? That's right, in a partnership, it's one versus one. As a worker cooperative, when at least three people are involved, you break the tie, and therefore, it's a true democratic decision. Here are two examples of worker co-ops. The first is the London Skateboard Shop in London, Ontario. The co-op started when five young guys who were into skateboarding noticed there was no skateboard shop in downtown London, and so they saw a need for one and decided to do something about it. However, instead of one of them taking on the role and all the responsibilities of the single owner, who then hires the staff and tells them how much they'll earn and when they work, they decided to open up as a worker cooperative, meaning all Equally, five guys own and operate the store. They all work in the store and they all have one equal vote on decisions, like how much they should pay themselves, what hours to operate, how to spend the profits, etc. La Siembra is a worker co-op in Ottawa. Their cooperative started in 1999 as the first importers of fair trade cocoa and sugar. They started in a church kitchen making hot chocolate and selling it along with cocoa and sugar imported from cooperatives in Costa Rica and Paraguay. Over the years, the Camino line has grown to include a full line of chocolate bars, baking products, and a range of industrial, larger format size premium ingredients. Today, La Amber Cooperative works directly with over 25 producer co-ops in 14 countries, contributing to the livelihoods of over 47,000 small scale family farmers. The other kind of co-op is a consumer co-op, where the company is actually owned by the customers. Although because you actually own an equal piece of the business, you're no longer a simple customer. You're what we call a member owner. And to legally form as a consumer co-op, you need to have at least five member owners. For example, 
To shop at Mountain Equipment Co-op, you buy a one-time, lifetime membership for $5. Most people don't realize this, but what that membership actually means is that you're an owner of Mountain Equipment Co-op and that you get an equal vote in the big decisions on how the company should be run. And as a member, you can actually run for the board of directors if you're really passionate about the business. When it comes to your cell phone provider, most of you have a plan with a large Canadian company. Hay Communications Co-op is a cell phone, internet, and cable company that's owned by people who live in the region of southwestern Ontario around Exeter. The member owners of Hay decide how much profit the co-op should make on various types of services, and they decide how to spend their profits, including where to lay the fiber and put up the towers that improve connectivity and bandwidth for their members. Collectively, the whole community decides the best way to connect homes, businesses, hospitals, and schools to the internet. So now that you know this, you can pay for a membership at Costco. Do you think Costco is a consumer co-op? Here's the answer. You can become a member at Costco and you can get discounts with your membership, but you don't become an equal owner who gets a vote as to how the business is run. So no, Costco is not a consumer co-op. So say you want to start your own worker co-op, but you think to yourself, I don't know a bunch of other people who are passionate about the same work as I am. You may also be unsure about co-ops because you still want to make your own decisions about your own business and not have to include others in all the decisions. Well, that's where something like this wedding co-op in Scotland is really cool. This is a worker co-op made of many sole proprietors who work in different areas. There's a photographer, a cake baker, DJs, event planners, limousine drivers, and even a bagpiper who realized that if they formed a cooperative, they could do their own business, but also split the expenses of things like office space, promotion and advertising, the cost of running a website, bulk buying of supplies, networking, etc. It's so smart. They would all agree to put a small percentage of their profits into the co-op and suddenly you have a whole network of people promoting you. So if I'm a photographer and someone hires me to shoot their wedding and likes my work, the first thing I'll say is, do you have a cake yet? What about a DJ? Because I know some talented people who are part of my co-op. So let's look at an example of how we're used to the way many big corporate businesses operate. Instead of naming any existing companies, let's pretend there's a big milk corporation called Mega Milk. And let's say that Mega Milk's head office is in Toronto, where many big corporations are located. So where does Mega Milk get its milk from? That's right, from dairy farmers across Ontario. These farmers produce the milk on their farm and then sell it to Mega Milk. That's how they make their living. Now these farmers could live anywhere in Ontario, such as this particular farm located all the way across the province in Fort Francis. So these farmers ship their milk all the way across the province to Mega Milk, and then basically the transaction is over. Mega Milk pays the farmer, sells the milk, and runs the company however they choose. Now you might be wondering, what's the problem with that? That's how business is run. The problem is that the farmer really has no power. If that one farmer doesn't really like the way Mega Milk does business, do they have any say? And if they raise a stink about it, what do you think will happen? Mega Milk will probably say, thanks for your opinion, and see you later. What's more, when Mega Milk makes a profit, where does this profit go? Does it go back to the farmer? No, of course not. The profits Mega Milk makes go to a small group of shareholders. And these shareholders will almost certainly not be from Fort Francis. They could be wealthy individuals living half a world away. And what this means is that they will probably be most concerned with the profits Mega Milk is making because they'll want as much money as possible. It probably won't even occur to them to wonder what is best for the individual farmers or what's going on in Fort Francis or Ontario or even Canada. And so this model of the big fish doing what it wants and swallowing up the little fish 
that we often see in our capitalist culture arises. But we need to once again ask ourselves, does it have to be this way? Is there another model where the profits can stay within the community and when the, where the farmer has more power? Where the company isn't run based on the decisions of someone wealthy who lives halfway across the world? Now the chances are if one farmer feels this way, there are probably many others who feel likewise. And so approximately 50 years ago, a whole group of Ontario farmers, frustrated with how the system works and in having no say, gathered together with the thought of, why don't we pool our money and resources and create our very own dairy company, one that we control and where we keep the profits. And so that is exactly how Gay Lee Foods Cooperative was started. Nowadays, Gay Lee is a cooperative equally owned by 1,300 Ontario dairy farmers. All the farmers pooled their money and built their own processing plants. Now they equally decide what products to make and how to advertise and all the other decisions that the company makes. And best of all, where do the profits that they make go? They don't leave the country or even the province. They are distributed back to the farmers and to the local communities. And best of all, when it comes time to make these decisions, each and every member farmer of Gay Lee has an equal say or vote in how these profits should be distributed. So what this means is that the usual model of the big fish swallowing up the little fish now gets turned around and the power goes back into the hands of the majority and not just the richest. Here's a perfect example of a big fish and what happens when a company is consumed by the profit only mentality. Now, not only is Walmart a big fish, it is actually the biggest fish as they are the number one company on the Fortune 500 list with $514 billion in revenue and in 2019 had $6 billion in profit. And you know what else they did? Despite the fact that they made $500 billion in revenue, a Walmart in Ohio decided that they would be really generous and actually run a food drive for its own employees. That's right, this is an actual picture from a Walmart in Ohio. The store ran a food drive for its own workers so they could have nice Thanksgiving dinners. Does anyone else see something terribly wrong here? This company makes billions in profit, but for some reason, they can't put some of all those profits back into the workers who make their company work? Is it that crazy an idea to actually take some of those millions and millions and not give them to a small group of shareholders and executives, but actually pay your staff a decent wage? Once again, we ask ourselves, does it have to be this way? What if we could beat the system? Imagine that instead of having to buy your groceries at a large corporate grocery store, where you have no say in what products they sell, where the profits go, and how much they pay their staff, that you and all your neighbors actually owned your local grocery store? And in doing so, you were able to ensure that you're buying from local producers and ethical companies, ensure that those who worked in the store earn a fair, livable wage, and ensure that your money stays within your community and doesn't disappear into the deep pockets of some foreign shareholders. This is exactly the model of the Mustard Seed Co-op in Hamilton, Ontario. The Mustard Seed is a community-owned, cooperative grocery store with nearly 3,000 member owners. What this means is that anyone in the community can shop there, but if you buy membership and become a member owner, you get discounts, other benefits, and most importantly, an equal vote as to how the cooperative should be run and the direction it should go. Is anybody a cashier or have a friend who's a cashier? Because if so, you may be especially interested in this next bit. Because one of the most important decisions is to put people ahead of profits. The member owners of the Mustard Seed decided that they should pay their staff, including cashiers, almost double what cashiers would make at Walmart. The workers at the Mustard Seed all make over $20 an hour. 
Now, if this little cooperative grocery store can do that, why can't or won't other huge corporate grocery stores do the same? And what's most exciting is that these kinds of innovative community-owned stores are popping up everywhere and they're gaining momentum as we recognize the need to support those local businesses that do put people before profit and who buy their food from local farmers and not ship them from across the continent just because it's cheaper. Okay, here's a very important question. Who owns your bank? If you think the government, you should know that most adults will answer the same thing. Most people believe that the government owns their bank, but that's not the case at all. The truth is that a corporate or private bank is a corporation. It's a for-profit business. And just like other corporations, it's owned by a small group of shareholders or private business people, not the government. And its purpose is to make as much money as possible for those shareholders. We think of a million dollars as being a lot of money, and of course a billion as being a lot of money. But do you realize just how much it is? Okay, I'm going to give you one million dollars, but I'm going to give it to you one dollar at a time. One dollar per second starting now. How long do you think it will take until I reach one million? Twelve days. In twelve days, you would have one million dollars. But what if you come back to me and say, thanks so much for the million, but I had a big party on the weekend and I need a little more money if you don't mind. I'll need one billion dollars now. I say, no problem, I brought a little extra. I'll just keep going with handing you a dollar a second. So it took me 12 days to get to 1 million. If I kept going to get to a billion, do you know how long it would take me to get to a billion? 32 years. That's how much more 1 billion dollars is. When you think that there are people starving and who can't afford rent, yet there are billionaires living in the same country, something's not right. We did the billion dollar exercise to illustrate how huge a billion dollars is. So of course you can imagine how much more massive 15 billion dollars is. And do you know what 15 billion dollars represents? In 2019, 15 billion dollars is the combined total of what the five big corporate Canadian banks gave out as bonuses to their employees the majority of that amount going to the executives. And they complained to say it was the worst year for bonuses in over a decade. Complaint about $15 billion. Those are profits from their customers' money. Do their customers get a say in where the $15 billion should go? Nope. But does it have to be this way? So we mentioned credit unions before. As we saw earlier, credit unions have remained a bit of an enigma to the Canadian public. Most people know they have something to do with finances, but don't know much more than that. The truth is actually really simple. A credit union is just like a bank, but with a key difference. It's a cooperative bank. What that means is that a credit union provides all the same services as any other bank savings and checking accounts, loans, mortgages, etc. But the difference is in its structure, as a credit union is a consumer co-op, which much like we saw earlier, means that it is owned equally by the people who use it, namely those who have an account at the credit union. So like all co-ops, every single member gets a vote as to how the co-op is run, and any one of the members can run for the board. And maybe one of the coolest things is that unlike corporate banks, credit unions are not for profit. So what that means is the goal of a credit union is not to make as much money as possible for a small group of shareholders who may live across the world, but instead the goal of a credit union is to do what's best for its member owners who live in the same community as the credit union. Therefore, the billion dollar bonus scenario we encountered before would never happen in a credit union, 
Or if it did, it would be because the majority of its members all voted to dispense $15 billion in this fashion. And really, what are the chances that a few hundred or a few thousand members would vote to give the profits to a very few rich people? Not very likely. So why do you think credit unions aren't as well known as the corporate banks? Well, first, credit unions are owned by the members who live in their community. And so they're generally quite a bit smaller than the big national banks, which can be found across the country. There are no national credit unions because that would kind of defeat the purpose of existing to fill the community's needs. Also, because profits are voted on and redistributed back to the members and the community in different ways, historically a lot of money hasn't been pumped into massive marketing campaigns on TV or billboards. However, this has started to change a little in the last few years, especially after the 2008 stock market collapse, when people around the world got fed up with the corrupt practices of large financial institutions and wanted an alternative. Credit unions are able to work together to produce a video and a marketing campaign because credit unions aren't in competition with each other. Like all co-ops, they exist to fill a need, and so one credit union would never promote their service over another because they're all part of the same family. And as you can see here, there are some very unique credit unions, like the police credit union and the teachers credit union, where the members are a community of police officers or teachers. And so the services of those credit unions are tailored to meet the needs of those specific members. So obviously, I feel pretty passionately about the cooperative model being a force of good in our communities. But I'm not the only one. The cooperative business model has been so successful and sustainable that the, uh, that the United Nations announced that 2012 was the International Year of Cooperatives, declaring cooperatives to be the business model of the future. And what's extremely cool is this is actually the only time in history that a business model has ever received this honor. It's actually no wonder that the UN feels so strongly about co-ops. As we can see here, three Canadian studies have shown that not only is the cooperative model good for the community and planet at large, it's actually your smartest move if you're starting a business. This shows that if you're going to start your own business, you have more than double the chance of staying in business 10 years down the road if you open as a cooperative as opposed to any other type of business. More than double! Why do you think this is? Well, when you're a sole proprietor, you're pretty much on your own to make your business work. It's sink or swim. You can get loans, acquire investors, etc., but basically you're on your own little island. A big difference is that when you incorporate as a cooperative, you're instantly part of a family or network of businesses that are all connected. Principle six is actually cooperation between co-ops. So what that means is that it's part of the code for all these other co-ops to help you out, to support you, to work with you. No other business model has this support system built into its foundation. And what's super exciting is this logo represents cooperatives around the globe. So from now on, every time you see this logo, you'll know that the business or product comes from a worker-owned or consumer-owned cooperative. Okay, so now that you've had a crash course in cooperatives, remember this? Let's come back and see if we can solve this problem, given what we've learned today. You're a band of musicians who don't want to give up the rights to your songs, don't want to give up 95% of the profits, and don't want to be controlled by a record company. But you don't have enough money to record your own album, as it costs a lot to rent or buy equipment, own or book a studio, a producer, do all your own graphic design, marketing, and promotion. But you definitely don't want to be under the control of some big corporate record company who are going to basically own you. So what do you do? How can we solve this? Start a co-op. Who are you going to start it with? How about other bands who are in the same position, who will pool their money and resources to help support each other. Here's a group who did just that. 
Blocks Recording Club in Toronto is a worker-owned cooperative music label. They share in expenses, promotion, rentals, etc. They are a music community who have realized they don't need to be at the mercy of some huge company, that they can control their own fate. And best of all, when they sell a $13 album, instead of 66 cents, how much does the band keep? As much of the $13 as they want. The bands who are part of the co-op label decide how much to reinvest in the co-op for rent and other costs, then whatever's left goes to the band. The point is, it's up to them. And this idea is taking off. Cooperative labels are record labels owned and operated by the, by the bands, and they're popping up everywhere. Here we have a few from the east coast of Canada, All Hands Electric from the Bronx, and Headquarters, who are a heavy rock co-op label, also from Toronto. So what do you think of this cooperative model? Hopefully you'll start passing on the word about co-ops, and even better, we'll start to really think about where you buy your products. That when, whenever possible, you're choosing local businesses, whether co-ops or not so that you're keeping your money within the community or buying from companies who are ethical and who help others in need in other communities, for example, by chewing, choosing fair trade products first. For more information on co-ops, visit www.ontario.coop. Thank you so much for listening.